the essence of ADHD is we understand from the executive functioning standpoint, organizing behavior across time towards you know, some outcome that we want, we, we know it'll be better, or, you know, we want to achieve it, um, but for which there's not immediate enough payoff or increments. So that's part of the, the work is let's break down the increments. I heard a nice analogy. You might be driving in fog and you can only see 20 feet ahead of your car, but you can drive 3,000 miles seeing 20 feet ahead of your car. And that notion of, well, I really want to see farther and things like that. And you might have to drive a little slower, but that's far enough at a certain speed to get to get where you want to go. ADHD Rewired episode 309. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am happy to welcome back to the podcast. It's been quite a while uh, since he was on the podcast back in episode 99. We were talking about CBT and ADHD, and that is uh, Dr. Russell Ramsey. He is the co-founder and co-director of the University of Pennsylvania Adult ADHD Treatment and Research Program and an associate professor of clinical psychology and psychiatry in the Penn Medical School. He's authored five books, including the recently released Rethinking Adult ADHD and numerous peer-reviewed professional articles and book chapters on issues related to adult ADHD. He serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Attention Disorders and has served or is serving on the professional advisory boards of many ADHD organizations. Dr. Ramsey is also a member of the Chad Hall of Fame. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Eric. All right. So uh, this is an, an area that is near and dear to me as uh, someone who works uh, with adult ADHD, uh, doing coaching, and so much of coaching is very CBT-based. So um, let's dive right into why are we rethinking adult ADHD? Right, right. Well, you know what? The, uh, the original title for the book was going to be thinking through adult ADHD, how thoughts and beliefs turn intentions into actions and parenthetically or not. Uh, the role either, it can either facilitate engagement or create barriers. And it was just thought um, by the much wiser book production staff than I am, they have a shorter title. So the rethinking was maybe not exactly a rethinking, but a deep dive into the the cognitive, the C in CBT, about the roles of the thoughts and beliefs in, you know, hence the subtitle, turning intentions into actions, where for my money, that's where change happens. It's behavioral, at least for adults with ADHD, and we could argue elsewhere. Um, so negative thinking, you don't think yourself into having ADHD. But, and I think more and more research is bearing this out, living with ADHD, particularly if it's gone undiagnosed for a length of time, mm -hmm. can create uh, or at least contribute to negative mindsets. And I think going back to one of the, the early popular books on adult ADHD, you mean I'm not lazy, stupid, or crazy? The, the reason I always cite that title, and it probably still resonates for readers, is those are the mental attributions. And once people get the idea, get the diagnosis, oh, you mean I'm not lazy. It's not me being stupid. How can I do a, a, a tax extension every single year? Um, how do I end up in this situation again? It, we, we start having these outlooks, these mindsets that 
can become self-fulfilling prophecies. So the Rethinking Adult ADHD, it's a cutesy little title for a deep dive into the, the cognitive domain and the influence of cognitions and beliefs. When when we were talking uh, about a week ago, um, and we were talking about these these main cognitive themes, and you were kind of pointing to that in depression, sort of the main main theme, um, and the cognition is around around loss and anxiety. Its main main themes are uh, fear and uncertainty. Uh, you mentioned in bipolar disorder, uh, the sort of inflation of of gains. Um, talk about the that main cognitive theme that you're seeing uh in an adult adhd right and i think i also mentioned it was back in tony rostain the the my psychiatrist colleague and the other co-founder co-director of the pen program and common co-author uh we were presenting it was probably our first international conference uh, and it was very focused on cbt and probably the first time many people have heard of cbt for adult adhd at that time and in the Q&A after, uh, one of the members of the audience, a very experienced expert, uh, CBT researcher and professional, asked me, what is the main cognitive theme? Because in cognitive behavioral therapy, the types of distorted thoughts, all or nothing thinking, mind reading, negative fortune telling, the categories are the same, but there are subtle thematic differences that you outline. So for depression, it's a sense of loss, or I'm going to have to do without, or I'm less than. Anxiety, it's the threat that comes from uncertainty. You can't tell me for sure this is going to work out well. Right, nothing's certain. And with hypomania or mania, there's infl infl inflated positive thoughts of, um, okay, this will be okay. It's okay if I go gambling or things like that. So the question was posed to me, what's the main cognitive theme in adult ADHD? And at that point, I think it's fair to say myself or my colleagues, uh, Mary Salanto, Steve Safran, uh, Alexandra Phillips, and in Germany, um, I guess we were at the forefront of doing this. We were just like looking at the CBT package and how do we make this work for positive change? Uh, just the fact that you know, cognitions were part of the game was still new. So I don't think anybody had really thought about, is there a theme? So... Those themes, that was pretty much the book ended up being my, I think it added up to with the publication date being, or the copyright date being 2020, an 18-year delayed answer to that <laughs> conference question. So, and um, Laura Naus has done some work, um, and we've published on the role of cognitive distortions, the automatic thoughts, you know, what thought went through your mind when. And we had one study where perfectionism came out as the main automatic thought. And Laura Naus and John Mitchell and colleagues developed an um, ADHD cognition scale, a seven item scale, that the main theme there is distorted positive thoughts. Hmm. I know this usually distracts me, but I'll just do it for a minute. <laughs> um, waiting till the last minute is part of who I am and, and various things like that. Um, which is really helpful, and we use the scale in our program now. But still, in looking at that, that that's, it struck me, and it came out while I was still writing the book, it struck me, well, that seems like it's still like a step downstream. What's driving those positive thoughts? And as you and others well know, ADHD is not a knowledge problem. Right. Oh, I'm supposed to start earlier? I never knew that. Like, I'll tell clients, if we're dealing with procrastination and I tell you, you need to start earlier, sue me for malpractice. You know that. <laughs> but when it comes, it's, it's, that's where the positive thoughts come in. I know I shouldn't do this, but I'll just do it for a minute. So in, in exploring, well, what is the main theme? And I was thinking about Albert Bandura's theory of self-efficacy, our belief in our ability to make changes for the better in our life. But that seemed to be still too global of uh, uh, a construct because that's true of depression, anxiety, that all these can erode that sense of efficacy due to mood, anxiety, uncertainty, and with ADHD, the executive function problems. And I still remember reading um, one of his books and ran across a section on self-regulatory efficacy, which I had never heard of before. I heard of agency, the belief that we can make changes in our life and efficacy is more specific. So 
As an example, agency is the belief that we can make improvements in our life, say our occupation, by getting educated, getting trained. Efficacy would be, I can sign up for this certification class. I can sign up for a coaching program and become a coach. Self-regulatory efficacy, when I was reading it, was virtually a rewording of the executive functions. Can people stick with a plan uh, throughout all the dissuading factors, the distractions, the boring stuff you have to do, written much more elegantly than I just described it. But it's pretty much self-regulatory efficacy is, if I sign up for the coaching program, can I make it to all the sessions, get all the credentialing hours, all the, the things, not due to lack of interest or lack of capability, I might want to be uh, on the Philadelphia 76ers as a basketball player, but I just don't think I have the skills. No, it's something that the person has the capacity to do. But like I said, the rewording of the, the um, executive functions, can we do the day in and day out stuff, organized behavior across time to achieve the goals? So that's still a broader term. But per, putting it in the phrases, I, the terms I've heard clients describe over the years, and I had mentioned this before as like one of the beliefs that I hear, but in running across the self-efficacy, the self-regulatory self-efficacy, my proposal for the book, and there's, there's no research to support this yet, but before the now scale, there really wasn't a cognitive scale designed specifically for adults with ADHD. And um, I've gotten to know Dr. Well, Laura over the years, and I think she's doing some research where she's adding in what I'm about to say. But the, I, I think um, going back to the ant, this book being a book length, 18 year delayed answer, in terms of the automatic thoughts, what thoughts go through your mind? I hear a lot of people say, and I propose this as the main theme and they're related of the automatic thoughts, self mistrust. I know I can do it, but I don't trust that I'm going to be able to make myself do it at the exact time and place that I want to or need to. So that would be that that can lead to that distorted thought. I know this will distract me, but I'll just do it for a moment. And then, excuse me, on a deeper level, there is some evidence to suggest that um, in terms of the core belief, so the automatic thoughts, what thought went through your mind when? Um, that you could consider as an analogy, that's like the weed. That's the weed that you can see above the ground. The core beliefs or these underlying themes, and this is more the, the cognitive behavioral therapies non-conscious. These are the recurring situations that come up with, and this is like our rules for the world. This is how the world is. This is how I am. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I should go back. The automatic thoughts is self-distrust. And then the core theme of the belief is self-mistrust. What's the difference between mm-hmm. distrust and mistrust? Well, looking it up, distrust is more immediate and shorter term, was mistrust is more of a pervasive. So hence, it seemed like distrust is better for the immediate thoughts and mistrust better for the core beliefs. Um, but that's what I'll hear people describe. I know what I need to do, but I just don't do it or I got started on it, and then I put it off for a while. I'm waiting. I'm getting ready to be ready. I need to be in the mood for it. And, you know, I have heard people, and that is what resonates for me. It's not an empirical study, but a lot of empirical studies start with these clinical experiences. People saying, I just don't trust that I'll remember. I will just don't, I'm, I don't trust that I'll be able to keep to the plan. And so for me, that seems to be that understanding on the cognitive piece And as I make the point in the book, the main outcome measure is behavior. Are you making changes? Is your life getting better? But the the cognition is like a a ligament between the intention and the action. So it's another element that we can ask, okay, you've come up with this good plan. What are your thoughts about doing it? What are the thoughts that you would imagine you will have at the time you have to do the task that for 23 hours and 59 minutes, you're sure you're going to do this. That last minute, what are the thoughts that'll be, here's a reason why I shouldn't do it right now. Here's a reason why it's logical for me to wait. And you know what? If we do get back to it and get it done, there's no problem. But for a lot of, and you probably know from coaching, these are the pain points that people bring in. So sorry for the delayed answer. I've had 18 years to think about this. (laughs) But, But even, you know, I was working on the book before I ran across the Bandura thing. So it was sort of, it really crystallized it. Um, and brought a lot of these things together. So that, 
uh, self distrust in terms of the immediate thought and the core mistrust. I can't trust myself to do it, even though I want to do it. I know I can do it. I have done it before, but will I be able to do it when the chips are down? Well, we know that so much of CBT is rooted in looking for evidence. Yeah. And for many folks with ADHD, there's a good amount of evidence of having a really hard time of, you know, having that self-regulatory efficacy or just being consistent um, over time. And so when we're looking at it in the, through the lens of, you know, these automatic negative thoughts, um, how does how do you play that out when you're looking at interventions where you're having maybe a client do a, uh, a thought record to really examine and challenge some of these thoughts? Right. Well, it is looking at the evidence and there's a, a lot of directions it can go in. So sometimes with the coping strategies, planner, time management, procrastination, starting earlier, breaking large tasks down, there's no trade secrets. We know what works, um, but it's the implementation problem the performance issue. So in anticipation, coming up with the plan, it is reviewing what are all the barriers to this plan, including the cognitions. Well, planners don't work for me. I use them for a little while, but then I stop. It doesn't work. Well, there's a subtle difference there. We lose the planner. We stop using it. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. Would we say that the um, we lose the car key? Does that mean the car doesn't work? Um, and, and it is still a problem, and it's not making light of it, but it's sort of going back to, okay, before we were talking about using the planner day-to-day -day and things like that, um, what sort of planner is going to be a best fit for you and increase the likelihood you're going to use it, digital or otherwise? Um, and there's going to be some trade-offs. Well, if I want to have a day at a glance planner, it might be this big and I'm going to have to get used to carrying it around in a backpack or something like that or as is. Um, the smaller one that fits into my, my purse, my pocket, whatever, it may not give me enough room. And just the problem solving around that and the personalization of treatment. Um, there's There can also be subtle differences. I was just earlier today, I think, working with somebody where you know, write, um, writing reports or assignments is often a major uh, source of difficulty because it's organizing behavior across time, organizing and sequencing thoughts, but how there can be an overgeneralization that any writing task is going to be like the essay on Moby Dick in high school. And are there other frameworks? It's still writing, but can we differentiate and separate out with greater specificity? What is it about this task that you have to do that may not require as much reading and processing of subtext and maybe it's reporting on data. And, and the goal then too, and there's a cognitive element of it, how do we break down tasks to make them more actionable, behavioral, and this goes back to the breaking down this task into small enough, small enough increments that there's the believability that, yes, I think I can do this even if it's not the whole thing, can you sit down and review the syllabus about the paper you have to write? You're not writing yet, but you're engaging in the task and you've just exponentially increased the likelihood that you'll take the next step into you know, writing the sentence. Even, um, hey, tell me in here, don't worry about writing it. What do you think is the first idea you want to express? And can you write it down now as a, a jump start? So all the, the little tricks of the trades that we knew we know, but packaging them differently, personalizing them, and getting down to another principle in the book is we're trying to take something like managing ADHD, which is broad, vague, and nonspecific, right. writing a paper, same thing. Let's get down to what is that smallest step from you're not doing it and planning to do it to you're doing it. And those pivot points that are more manageable and it could be, can you get to the gym? Even if you don't do your workout, can you at least get there? But we know once we're there, we've started the law, the behavioral launch sequence yeah. and even, and this is motivation, even resignation. Oh, all right. Let me just go for a little bit. That's motivation. It's not inspirational. It's not intrinsic motivation. I really want to work out because I want to be fit. I want to whatever. No, it's just I want to get it out of the way. I want Ramsey not to bother me about it the next <laughs> session, whatever it might be. But breaking it down to what's the point of if I can just go upstairs and get my gym bag, 
we're doing a behavior we've done before. So we start the launch sequence. We could always turn around and say, no, I'm not going. And I've had people say, I got to the gym and I left, but the vast majority and we're, we'll follow through at least a little bit. And we're just trying to change the ratio. It's never going to be a hundred percent, but if we can go from, I only follow through 30% of the time and not 70. If we switch that to 60, 40, my line is if we invented a medication with those results, we are billionaires. Yeah. People are lined up outside the pharmacy, but because it's behavioral, we focus on the 40%. And I think there's so, and that's part of the reframe. And there's yeah. so many of those, those, uh, distortions of the all or nothing thinking, um, right. about overgeneralization. Um, and, yeah. I, and I want to get into some of the more specific nuances of some of these more common, uh, cognitive distortions that we see in, in ADHD that are more ADHD flavored. Um, yeah. but before we do, I would like to take a quick break and then we will come right back. It's funny getting a diagnosis of something, but you don't really get a lot of tools from the medical community on really how to move forward and how to work on things more. You know, like they were like, all right, here's your prescription. And I said, okay, is this gonna, is this gonna make my life like so much better? They're like, well, you know, kind of. I didn't know what else to do and I wasn't prepared for that. And so I just started researching and trying to figure out like, how do I work this out now? How do I learn what I need to learn to function in the ways that I really need to function? It was super valuable to me. I found the podcast and I found the website and I signed up and I had no idea what I was going to learn, but I know that I get a lot out of talking to other people and sharing with other people and, you know, just being in a community in which people can advise based on true lived experience. And that is exactly what I found. And I've learned in this group just that you can go really far when you allow yourself to be vulnerable. And we all kind of had to talk about our real stories in here. And this is a place in which that's never going to go against you. That is only going to help you. And it's been just a real turning point in joy to understand the ways that I can improve my life through so many things that I didn't even know I could do. One of the big reasons why I decided to join the group was because I was just tired of being misunderstood. I decided to join the group because I wanted to learn to thrive with my ADHD. And I learned to let others around me know what I was dealing with and so that I could be better supported. And over the course of a year, basically, I was feeling so stuck and stagnant and just so unhappy with where I was. And I realized that I couldn't do it alone and something needed to change. Before the group, it never occurred to me that I should consider the time it would take to do a task when I have my to-do list. I never really thought to give time to the things that matter to me. I always felt like I haven't earned the time to do the things that I wanted to or cared about. And now I realize that actually is what the most important and that's what energizes you to do those other things that other people want you to do. And I think it's helped increase my happiness and make progress on things and it's made me more productive. I was kind of worried or nervous about, oh my gosh, three times a week for 10 weeks. But it was really a lot more manageable than I anticipated. And the group really, to me, it's like a safe haven. It's a judgment-free zone where we can be vulnerable and lift each other up. And we all have so much to offer. Before the group, I was frustrated with myself over things I was doing or couldn't get done. I was spinning. And now I'm more accepting that if that happens, I will be kind to myself because I realize I'm only human and sometimes ADHD wins. This group has been amazing. I never thought that I could go in front of a camera, A, B, that I would actually be emotional with a group of people I've never met. And I mean, I can't tell you, there was a couple sessions I just broke down in tears after the session was over. What I did not expect was to connect so quickly and deeply with all of our group members here. You know, I find as I listen to each one of you say things, there's something I can identify with where you're speaking part of my experience. What was so comforting too is that a lot of other people felt like that and the whole group feels like that. And to kind of work through that together was just a huge takeaway. And actually my anxiety, I went from, oh, how am I gonna beat this to, you can live with ADHD and be very successful. I've just learned so much. I just cannot believe that it's worked. 
I never knew that anyone was like me. I've been looking for a community for like two years and I just couldn't find one in my area. And I thought about starting one, but I said, I, there's no way I have the tools. I'm not ready for that. It was like, there's actually a class for people that can't get out of bed or, and I can't believe I'm finding success. Getting to know everybody and you hear that you're not alone, but getting to meet those other people and getting to be a part of that community is really validating and has been really amazing. And it's also pushed me out of my comfort zone and helped me grow and do the things that I wouldn't have been able to accomplish on my own. I think really getting people to say, why aren't you doing that? Those are the hard questions that you need somebody else to be able to look at you and kind of force you to reckon with. And that's really where the growth happened. So it was really good. Thanks to everybody who helped push me there. If you're thinking about joining this group and it's at the last second, do it anyway. Don't give yourself the time to talk yourself out of it. It's not worth doing. Just join immediately. Two weeks in and this had already paid for itself for me. It's powerful to find that you're not alone. You're not going to be judged for the struggles you have and it's going to help you move forward. If you're thinking about joining this group, you need to consider it. Just give yourself a chance and think about what is it costing you to not be able to thrive with your ADHD. That's really your biggest cost. If you're thinking about it, just do it. I had been tossing around the idea of doing it for a couple of sessions before I finally did, and I feel like it was a waste of time. So if you're thinking about it, then I say go for it. Your head's already in the right place. If you're thinking about joining the group, I would just say do it. Give yourself a chance. You deserve to give yourself that chance. If you're thinking about joining this group, know that you're not alone and that you can accomplish so much more. The structure and the support, I mean, there's magic in the group work. There's magic in working with a community of other ADHDers who all understand and offer support and new strategies. So it's like if a person is ready to be done living life on hard mode and wants to make progress, do the group. It's life changing. Registration is going on now and is by invitation only. Our registration kickoff event is going on today, February 18th at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. You'll have one more chance to join our March 5th event that starts at 9 a.m. Pacific. Go to coachingrewired.com to learn more and click the big green button to get invited. That's coachingrewired.com. All right, we are back. And uh, right before the break, I that was asking you about um, looking at the sort of the, the nuances and sort of the different sort of flavors of some of the more common cognitive distortions, like overgeneralization, all or nothing thinking. And you, you'd you'd point out if you had a uh, you know a sixty forty ratio on an improvement, like you know if that was a pill, you'd be you know right, right. So. In the the overgeneralization um, with, with ADHD, do you think that um, part of the challenge uh, can stem from difficulties in sort of that gestalt processing of seeing the big picture, uh, being able to see how context can be different? Um, I, mean, I, I, w- I was sharing with uh, uh, not that long ago one of my coaching groups that like I developed all of these you know calendar and, and task management strategies that, that work pretty well for me most of the time, and then I realized why I, I don't get shit done at home because I don't have any to-do list at home. And so yeah. I, I, I am like, it was funny to me that I realized, oh, I guess I'm just going to use my dry erase board on the kitchen um, uh, refrigerator and how right. many more home little home projects were actually getting done. And it was yeah. just funny that it never even occurred to me because <laughs> right, right. my task management is on my computer and I'm not looking at my computer when I'm at home. Right, right. And you know what? Building on the overgeneralization, we'll start with that one. Um, In the negative version, it's sort of like I was saying about like the planner or a writing assignment, remembering high school. And and just want to be clear, a lot of your audience probably understands this. When we talk about distortions, we're not talking about delusions. And most often they make perfect sense. And we all do these things every day. Oh, there's never parking around here. Well, it just means I have to park six blocks away and it's raining. And it's so, uh, and, but yeah, we know, we know the gist of it, but with overgeneralization in a negative way, um, a past frustration or actual failure or setback. 
And there may be ins- information to derive from that. Is there a learning difference that made that that wasn't accommodated? Did you recognize that you had ADHD at the time and adjust how you approach the task? Or were you trying the same thing that everybody was doing over and over again, which that's what we're going to do if it, without any personalization. So with the overgeneralization, okay, because I didn't do this well, I won't do anything like it well. That's where the specificity, all right, let's take a look at this task. And so, yeah, maybe in the domain of writing or using a planner, but let's come up with different ways of doing it. The planner doesn't have to be a, 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 a book form calendar. It can be a whiteboard and there may be some problem solving there. Okay. Between your work or school whiteboard and your home whiteboard, how are you going to transport things between? And it could be an index card that gets torn up once everything's yeah. and, and, you know, sitting across from a lot of people, pe- you know, people ask me for suggestions. I'll say, here's what I hear. But a lot of that comes from people who come up with some innovative way. Yeah. Like I never, would have thought of doing, but that's a, that itself is a beautiful solution. So the specificity and the differentiation of, yeah, we're talking about writing or whiteboards, but is there another way to do it that fits for you? And, and you know, so much of, of the work that I do too, or people are asking me, what should I do? And I, and my response to that, that is often, well, what works for me isn't necessarily going to work for you. And what I want you to really try to do is do some experimentation and be a scientist that is not attached to the results. Cause I think so many people have such a long experience of, I tried this, right. that didn't work. I tried that, that didn't work. And so there, there, there's an understandable level of discouragement. And so when we could help them understand that, like that if one part of it doesn't work, doesn't mean the whole thing doesn't work and, and helping, clients to to, um, change their, not just their thoughts, but the questions they're asking themselves. Like, is this writing assignment, is this different than other things? And this is something that I have actually worked on over the last couple of years because writing has been a struggle for me. And I hold a lot of that writing as a struggle belief from college when I once spent uh, an entire semester, like eight hours a day when I had incompletes for a semester working on a three page paper. So it's understandable why I have a little bit of writing trauma related to, to writing, yeah. but it's then like food poisoning in a way. Yeah. <laughs> right. no, seriously, that, no, that's an totally. analogy to use. Yeah. Yes. Cause what you did also, it, you were reframing the experiment. Dr. Beck in his classic cognitive therapy for depression calls it collaborative empiricism. Mm. Let's subject this to a test. Is there a way you can experiment with this or give it a try? And if the data come back, okay, this doesn't work for me. All right, fine. Let's let's find a workaround or maybe a different plan. But like over the last uh, year or two, I find myself that I'll I'll start writing something and these I these moments where I just pound something out. That's like, that was actually pretty good. And like, I it wasn't even, in, I didn't even intend it for it to be the piece that, that it was that I created. And so it made me sort of take a pause and, and reflect back, you know, not all writing is something that I don't like to do. Um, right. It's just that it goes back to that, that sort of mistrust in self of, am right. I going to be able to turn it on today? And you know what, uh, building on that, uh, working because writing is difficult for everybody. Um, and we think about it so much as handwriting or typing. A, a way we can use our, our alternate skills is, and I'll tell somebody, tell your dog what you, you know, the dog doesn't care. Tell the cat, tell an empty chair, tell your kid just what you want to express because conversationally, we might be better able to sequence our thoughts. And if we record it, voice activated software, whatever it may be, or sometimes just getting unstuck, we're trying to write something like it's a dissertation, but we just say, see Dick run. We say it in a clear way and that can help unlock, but we get so locked into fingers cramping over the keyboard and I have to get it done this way. So think of the, the more the, the ADHD sort of nuances. Do you see, are there differences in sort of general um, uh, cognitive distortions in a general population right. of someone dealing with anxiety or depression versus uh, overgeneralization with ADHD? Right. Well, some of the ones we see, and it goes back to that study our group did with the perfectionism, and this goes beyond the data, but in one study, and it was a, a classic cognitive distortion 
questionnaire that wasn't geared specifically for adults with ADHD, but perfectionism came out as far and away the, the number one, which at first didn't totally resonate because we, or at least I thought of classic perfectionism as you're trying to make it more perfect. It's not good enough yet. Let me get it out. Now, that version, which I think is the less frequent for adults with ADHD, very I've I've still quibbled with the name, but I call it like the ADHD tax in a way. So a student who is given an extension on a paper, uh, an extra week to work on it, still struggles in getting started because you think that would free them up a little bit. Okay, have some breathing space. But when people get stuck, I'm asking them what's going on. They say, well, now my paper has to be one week better than everybody else's. So it's not just an extension. It's almost like you have to pay this off with interest when that's not anywhere in the condition. It's just you have a week, but the parameter is still a five-page paper, three references, whatever. But in the person's mind, and this, I think, ties in a little bit with the guilt and shame. I shouldn't have to do this even though you made the request, you did your job, the professor granted it and understands that it's most likely not a time-based assignment. It's not like SATs, pencils down. It's, It's the quality of the work. And they go, yeah, I need to grade it by a certain time, but maybe it doesn't have to be in and you're not getting that much more advantage with a week. But in the person's head, it's like, now I really have to do a good job. Mm. But my, con- my conjecture about perfectionism is more front-end perfectionism. I have to be in the right frame of mind. I can't be distracted. I ha- everything has to be, you know, it's just like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, too hot, too cold. No, everything has to be just, just right. right. Yeah. And how often are we just right? And going back to the framing, one of the reframes with that front-end perfectionism, because you know, then we put it off waiting to be ready. And that's, that's part of where that self distrust comes in. I don't trust I can do it unless I'm well rested, do everything else first. And that's where going back to Nelson's scale, I'll do this other thing first and then come back. Um, but, um, with that, with the, um, front end perfectionism, then, you know, that, that's part of that, that distrust. Um, but then putting it off, waiting to be ready to do it, and um, I forget where I was going with it. So, but but that 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 says it enough. So it goes beyond the data, but it's it's the um, I'm probably saying it again the same way. Uh, just getting ready to get ready, but then there's that relief by putting it off. So that's that's a big thing with procrastination, I would say, and um, that that self distrust. I, I remember during the uh, the the uh, year's chat conference, you would identify things that were. Uh, perfectionism that I hadn't always thought of as perfectionism. And I absolutely identify myself as a perfectionist in recovery. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and so that things of like, I have, you know, everything has to be just right. Um, right. What, what were some of the other sort of areas of perfectionism? Cause this is something that, that comes up so frequently with, with my, right. my groups. Well, r- related to that, and it sort of speaks back to the all or nothing thinking, it's either good or bad, pass or fail. Um, I was productive or not productive. And there's there's a lot of gray area in there. We may not get everything done and we might've set too high of a bar, but um, we've gotten some things done and that you know, some days we get less than we intended done, other days we get a little more. But you know, it's the, the reframe is all or something thinking. So even if you can't get everything done, You can get at least something done and that's still progress. And we measure these things over not just one day, but it's, it could be over a couple days, over a week, over a month. And so with that, it's sort of like a sport like baseball, any one game, a batter might go over five at bats, but over the course of a season, that averages out when they have a game, they go three for five and they could be a 300 hitter, which if you're not a sports fan is really good. Um, but any one day there could be variation in between. So that sort of perfectionism of I have to be on all the time. And if I don't meet the bar, then it fails. It's like, no, there's, there's matters of degree. This might've been, Hey, I got like 84% of things done and that can be good. Now, within that, though, there is the um, pseudo-efficiency or, or the procrastivity. 
<laughs> yeah, talk, talk it, about that. I, I read yeah, it in the journal you wrote about that. That was right, right. But but in in the procrastivity, this is procrastination by doing something else that is productive but lower priority. So it's this is timely for the time this is being recorded. Doing the lawn rather than working on income taxes. So it feels productive. And in the hierarchy of procrastination, I have seen it referred to as productive procrastination. And it's great to salvage a day that you go, I'm just not doing taxes today. Let me at least do catch up on my emails and offload some stuff. Um, but in, in the all or nothing thinking, it's so almost like this self-medicating. I'll do these other things and feel good for a while. But then later on, we go, yeah, but I had reserved today to work on at least making some headway on taxes. So there is that. And, you know, from coaching, everything's context specific that we want to take a look at. All right, it's it's better to salvage the day than not getting anything done. But the concern is that you're running up against the tax deadline. Or, and let's take a look at this thing that's repetitive, repeatedly being deferred. And let's really find a way to focus in on this and boil it down to what's a way you can actually get engaged in that. And that comes back to that, that how do we make it actionable? What's something you can do behavioral, even if it's not productive, like I'm going to take all the envelopes that say important tax document enclosed and at least open them up and spread them out on my living room table. If you stop there, at least you didn't procrastinate, but you just exponentially increase the likelihood you'll get engaged. But it's also reframing the task down. What's that smallest actionable step that you go, I can at least do that. I mean, it's amazing how in, in, in my groups where we have everyone post a, a goal that they want to be able to share on Friday that they accomplished. And when we go through, we, we check in with everyone and say, all right, on Monday, you said you wanted to do this. And let's say someone's goal was they were going to uh, go, go on a walk three out of the five days. And they're like, well, I did two, but one of them really didn't count. And I'm like, how many walks did you go on last week? And like, zero. So I'm like, so you made really good progress this week. Right, right. And for so many people, it's like, oh, I, I, guess I, I guess I did make some progress. Right. And that raises a good point. And I have a section on this in the book. And um, it's point, you know, I think that's the role of a, an advisor, a coach, a therapist, whomever else. It's pointing out these documented, not making it up, not candy coating it. Well, you really intended to do it and think, no, it's sort of, no, here's what you actually actually did. And even if the walk didn't count, well, I didn't walk around the whole block, but how far did you walk? Or yeah, I only walked halfway around the block and then I walked back home. Well, actually, you know what? If you walked halfway around the block and came back home, <laughs> you actually did a block. You just didn't do the circular block. But, but you know what? But those are some of the things where the, the distorted negative thoughts will do, yes, but mm -hmm. I didn't do it the way I outlined it. And it's, yeah, but you kept with the spirit of it. It can be a both and. All right, you stopped halfway. So what happened then? And let's understand it, but let's not lose sight of that's that's movement. I'm a big believer in the idea that that goals aren't necessarily like the intention of a goal is not to necessarily hit the goal is to give you a direction to get towards right. what you're aiming for. Right. 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 Because you can run Absolutely. a mile. But if your if your goal is a mile in the other direction, then that was just a lot of activity and not actually doing anything to get you towards that goal. Right, um, right. So we have a goal of having one more break, which we're going to do right now. And then uh, when we come back, I want to talk to you a little bit about the the underlying thought process that a lot of people have about feeling like what they're doing is never enough. We will be right back. Thank you to all of our patrons who help make this podcast possible with your contributions. Consider becoming a patron today. Give a gift that makes sense to you and we'll give you a gift right back with perks. If you find value in these podcasts, become a patron at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Check out the perks starting at just $5 a month. And remember, you can join me and a small group of other patrons every fourth Tuesday of the month for a group coaching call on Zoom if you support us at $25 a month or more. Our next coaching call will be on February 25th at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Put that in your calendars. Whatever your reason for giving and whatever you can give, thank you. It really does help and it really does mean a lot to me. Become a patron at ADHDrewired.com slash 
Patreon. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. This week on Hacking Your ADHD, Will Curb will delve into life lessons from video games. Subscribe to these short, mindful ways to hack your ADHD. Check out Hacking Your ADHD on Monday and every Monday. Join Will as he explores ways that you can work with your ADHD brain to do more of the things that you want to do. If you haven't yet checked it out, do yourself a favor and go subscribe to Hacking Your ADHD. That's Hacking Your ADHD, available to everyone, everywhere you consume podcasts. And if you are looking for more ADHD content and you are looking for information around kids that supporting parents and teachers, check out our other podcast, ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan. Both Hacking Your ADHD and ADHD Essentials are available Everywhere you consume podcasts, both podcasts are part of the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Mark your calendars to join us next month for our live Q&A. Join me, Brendan Mahan from ADHD Essentials and Will Curb from Hacking Your ADHD as we answer your questions live. Our last episode, we answered the question, how to restore and revive yourself between hard tasks. You have a question? We do this every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Our next live Q&A will be on March 10th at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. Join us and others from our ADHD community for this live event to register for our free Q&A where we will answer your questions and help you with your challenges. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. And we'll see you there. All right. So uh, we are here for the last uh, last stretch of, uh, of today's episode. And one of the underlying thought patterns that I see so often, this is something that I've personally done a lot of work on myself as well, is part of it is this like unrealistic expectation um, of even what reality is, is and other people are expecting of us. Um, so I, I've come up with a this sort of motto that perfect sucks and good enough is great, right? And I was actually just talking with uh, with someone earlier today about um, you know he really he's a, he's a uh, high achiever and really likes excellence. And I said, well, what if we looked at a goal as getting really pursuing excellence at going after good enough? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> So what, what is this drive and how do we help uh, people realize that the the hundred percent that people are shooting for, that nobody even wants that? Right, right. Well, one of my colleagues at the Center for Cognitive Therapy, Corey Newman, has this thing. If we were at our best all the time, our best would be average and it wouldn't be anything special. So if we if we batted a thousand as a baseball player, that wouldn't be any fun. There's no challenge. So, no, but I think there's, you know, bringing it back to the cognitions, very often there's comparative thinking. Well, everybody else must be able to do this okay. And there, again, going back to a theme, there may be some truth to um, people without ADHD may have an easier time with some things, but it doesn't mean it's effortless. Oh, nobody else has to use a planner as much as I do. When in fact, you might see that somebody still uses a planner and they might, it might be more habitual and you just don't notice it but they probably have some sort of planning system. So it's not like somebody has this, you know, magical working memory that they can think about, Oh yeah, I know what I'm going to serve for the 4th of July picnic or something like that. So that, or taxes or writing that nobody likes it. It may be more effortful for the client. um, And that's important to acknowledge, but the comparative thinking that, you know, other people fall short or they struggle with these things or nobody's at their best all the time. And then um, recognizing that, and that's where sometimes I'll use self-disclosure. I'll pull out my to-do list or say, hey, I can tell you the the couple things I meant to do over the weekend that I didn't get to, and that the relapse rate for procrastination is 100%. Um, But the other thing is, and it's like one of the, under the parts of how we frame or reframe things, 
Um, and that could get dismissed as glass half full versus half empty, but it's like framing it in actionable terms. And the phrase I use is a sense of sufficiency, lowering the bar for a task. So somebody feels sufficient that I can do that because a lot of times we're, or anybody, any of us, but particularly adults with ADHD who are working on changing it, the assume bar for this is what I should be able to do. But then there's that, that essential tension. This is what I should be doing. And this is the right thing, but I'm not sure. And we, anybody could set the bar. You have to jump this far that we look at it and say, we, I can't do that. And probably are making an accurate assessment. Um, so if we can pull that down a little bit to say, I can at least do this. I know this is variation on a theme, but that's the essence of ADHD as we understand from the executive functioning standpoint, organizing behavior across time towards, you know, some outcome that we want. We, we know it'll be better. Well, you know, we want to achieve it. Um, but for which there's not immediate enough payoff or increments. So that's part of the, the work is let's break down the increments. I heard a nice analogy. You might be driving in fog and you can only see 20 feet ahead of your car, but you can drive 3000 miles seeing 20 feet. Ahead mm, of your car. I like that. And that notion of, well, I really want to see farther and things like that. And you might have to drive a little slower, but that's far enough at a certain speed to get. I think that's really helpful. Out. One of the yeah. things I often, you know, talk about in my groups is that like this idea of begin with the end in, in mind, like yes. for when you have ADHD, it's almost magical thinking. Cause it's like, how do you do that? But, yeah. but we don't need to know what the end looks like. We just need to know what the next couple steps look like and try, Trust ourselves that once we get to those next few steps, we'll be able to figure out the next few steps right. and the next few steps and, and so on and so on. Yeah. And my, my play on that one is, yeah, start with the end in mind. Have, have the overarching goal. And this comes from research on, on self-regulation and impl actual implementation strategies. It works best if it's tethered towards a goal, mm -hmm. but the implementation is, you know, what's the next incremental behavior. So yeah, start with the end, you know, start with the end in mind, but begin with the beginning in mind. And so I'm going towards here. I want to drive to New York city, but let me start with getting out of my parking lot, getting on the highway, the Pennsylvania turnpike, whatever, wherever you're taking. It's kind of like when I'm going through O'Hare airport, which is my local airport that I absolutely yeah. hate. That's like, that's like literally my ADHD hell. Um, yeah. I get so overstimulated and easily lost going through O'Hare airport. And so I'll ask, you know, someone that works there, like, how do I get to this part of where I'm going? And they'll give me all those directions. And after the first direction, I've tuned out and I'm just repeating what they said. And I know when I get to that next point, I'm going to ask the next person that I find. There you go. There you all go. Right. And that works. And you know, all these things, these, these analogies, these metaphors, uh, the start with the end in mind, but begin with the beginning in mind. This is what people remember. That's, that's, that's a cognitive shift because these examples are the takeaways that people remember. And these can be the, the little, yeah, you know, whether it's on your screensaver or it's the wallpaper on your phone, and it might have to change up a little bit because they get boring after a while and you look at them. But these little reminders, these are the cognitive shifts. All right. In this moment. Okay. Yeah. Let me just get directions from this person, get to the next one, get to the next one and I'll get there. Let me ask you this. So on, I mean, you've been doing this work for, for quite some time. Um, how long, because for someone listening who, you know, any goal that they were going after or any progress they, they want to, to make on something, they wanted it yesterday, um, which we all relate to, is how long can somebody expect, on typically on, on average, I know it, it often varies, that when you're really working on identifying the cognitive distortion and coming up with healthy replacement thoughts, how long until those become the new automatic belief system? Well, my answer for that a lot, and not just with ADHD, but it's, you know what, there's likely always going to be some negative ones that creep in there. The nice thing about this, even the silly ones that we capture, there's never parking around here. Even if we know what we mean, even catching that, like the, the linguistics. So it's always a work in progress. The, the beauty all right, let me go back and answer the question. So I think we can get a lot better and quicker at catching them. And it almost becomes, even if the 
negative thought doesn't totally go away, it ends up being linked with, wait a second, there's never parking around here. No, I just got to go. Let me try this block five blocks away. Sometimes I'm lucky there. We can stay engaged. So it sort of gets linked with the response, which itself sort of weakens the the negative thought, if you will. Um, But the beauty of um, Dr. Beck's model, and there were philosophers before that talked about it, but the goal, it, it, it's a transferable, it's a transportable skill that even if we have a bad weekend and we start catching ourselves, okay, I'm telling myself because I didn't go to the gym and I justified eating more leftover Halloween candy than I intended, we can pull it back and say, all right, how did that result from that result from that result from that? And we can trace back and try to say, well, I can't change that, but I can focus on how I handle tonight, tomorrow. All right. What can I do and now? So it's part of an ongoing skill and process. I know one of my, uh, uh, I call them the, the top lies that I tell myself and I really believe. That's um, great, yeah. I, I still have the thought, this will just take five minutes. I can't tell you how often, I, and my now response to that is laughter because I know that nothing ever takes me five minutes, right. but I still have that thought. And there's a documented planning bias that, for i think it's with travel and also uh, also some like to do tasks when we have to estimate how long something will take there's a bias towards going towards the freakishly good example okay there was once i made it from the office to philadelphia international airport in under 15 minutes how long i'm going to leave 15 minutes when really it typically takes depending on the time but 30 to 45 minutes, even though the, as the bird flies, it's not that far, but, but stuff like that. Oh yeah. I've done a five page paper in under two hours. So I'm going to give myself two hours. So just, and sometimes just knowing that this is a human bias, not just with ADHD, with anybody that goes back to the framing because even like one of the studies of Kahneman Tversky on the, on the framing bias, they gave um, doctors, a scenario, okay, there's this outbreak and they've given the same scenario, but here's how many lives you can save with the treatment, but here are how many lives that still might be lost because the treatment won't work. And more doctors would endorse the treatment based on lives saved rather than these are the people that still die, even though the statistics were exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So the framing of it in more of a positive way, more people will say, well, it's, it's worth doing the treatment when it was like, these are lives that still will not be able to be saved. And again, a hypothetical situation, fewer doctors would endorse it. So framing a task so it's actionable, rather than here's what I should be able to do. I should be able to read the 50 page chapter in one night. It might be, how about 10 pages? And then reassess. I'm not saying you can't do it, but let's reassess and see, tell you what, if I can do this once a night, I can uh, can get it done by the weekend. All right. Are there any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to, to share? You know what? It's managing ADHD is hard work, um, but there are things that are helpful. The difficulty with it all, and I think I've made this point and colleagues have, the insidious thing is um, the follow through on these things. It requires engagement, but it's knowing that at the end they work And if you find a coach, a psychiatrist, a therapist who gets ADHD, and very often it's, yeah, these things are hard, but they're maybe differently difficult for other people, but still it's not like anybody else is getting off scot-free and let's do the experiment and see how far we get. And you know, once we get engaged, even though we might say, well, I still have to get 100% or an A plus, or I have to do it by whatever time, usually once people get engaged and hands on and they see the, process, the progress that they're making, they're a lot more willing to adjust. Okay, maybe I won't meet the original deadline that I set for myself, but I see I'm going to reach the end point that I want to get to. And as a final word, this goes back to, I haven't used this quote for a while, but it it was a college student who said, I'm going to graduate on time no matter how long it takes me. And I think that captures it because now it's off of on time towards what do I need to do to fulfill graduation requirements? And if I don't do it in four years, my degree is not going to look different. And we just forget about the deadline and it's more about the process. And hopefully the hey, I just did something I didn't think I could do. And that's going to be the most convincing evidence 
that we're going to have. Thank you so much, Dr. Russell Ramsey. His new book, Rethinking Adult ADHD. I'm sure you can get it anywhere where you get books. Yeah, um, yeah. We'll link his website up to the show notes because um, it's a really long one. So uh, just go to the show notes uh, of this episode, which is ADHDrewired.com slash whatever episode number this happens to be. I'm um, just looking at your podcast player to, to see that. Um, Dr. Ramsey, thank you so much for uh, for your time and for sharing your, your wealth of information. Thanks for having me. The work you do, we... I recommend your podcast to a lot of people. Well, thank you. Have a good one. Take care. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre 
interview. This is Eric Tiggers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.